Okay, so welcome to the Q&A section of our Early Literacy Clinic. And I just want to introduce to Koha. Koha, I think you've got some questions to hit me with. What's the first question? The first question is, we have had children who have been stuck at stage five now for ages. They are not passing stage five tests due to spelling errors. We have practiced and practiced and they seem to get it, but then the wheels fall off every time it comes to testing. Should I move them on? Okay, well, that's a really good question. That's probably one of the most common questions I get. Um, well, the first thing I would say is like, I, try, I really don't like to repeatedly teach stages four, five, six, and seven. The children get bored. It doesn't normally work, and you just kind of turn them off. So I would say if I've done stage five and the children haven't passed the assessment, which is not uncommon, the thing to do is to look at what was the reason why they failed the assessment? And there's two main reasons. One, they didn't hear every sound in, 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 in the words. Or two, um, they didn't know the consonant digraphs and trigraphs we've taught them in stage five. Um, so it's either going to be one of those two, or maybe it's both. And so your approach will depend on which one is the strongest. Now, the, uh, if it's that they're not hearing every sound in the words. That's a harder problem because that's something you will need to go back and teach, but maybe not do the whole stage five lesson. Maybe spend the next week on phonological awareness working on um, hearing every sound in a word. So playing phoneme fingers, for example, doing word stretching where you throw them a word and they grab it and they've got to stretch it like, mm, ah. You know, so they've got to, and there's got to be four steps for where their hands are to hear every sound. So phoning fingers, um, word stretching, um, those would be the things I would really focus on um, to, to get them to be hearing every sound. You could play reverse phoning lines where they pick up their whiteboards. You say four and they have to draw four lines and then you give them a word and they have to make the word, spell the word and make it fit the four phoning lines. So if their word that they've spelt has only fitted three, it tells them straight away they're not hearing every sound and it makes them work a bit harder. What if the problem is they don't know all the digraphs and trigraphs? Actually, I'm not too worried about that. They will all come in time. So would I let children move out of stage five if they pass their assessment? Yes, if it's just that they didn't learn all the digraphs and trigraphs. No, if they're not hearing every sound in a word. So if they're not hearing every sound in a word, go back and work on that. Okay, right, Dakoha, you got another question. Yes, I am an ECE teacher who have been teaching the letter sounds to my tamariki, who are soon to move to school. But recently I got criticised for doing this by someone who was inspecting our centre and told we should only do this if the child shows interest in the letters. What do you think about this? <laughs> what do I think about that? Um, okay, so the first thing is you're backed up by Tafariki. So Tafariki is the early childhood education um, curriculum. It got revised, I think, in 2017, and it always did have a lot in it on, about phonological awareness. But what surprised me when they revised it is they actually, in I think it was goal four under communication, uh, they actually included teaching children the letters and that um, of their name and getting them to recognize their name and recognize letters. So you are actually supported by Tafariki to do this and Tafariki didn't say only if they're interested but of course it's ECE so you know it's not a make or break I'm, I'm not particularly worried if children start school and they don't know their letters I can teach that easily and quickly and um, what I'm more worried about is their phonological awareness so if you feel that you've nailed the phonological awareness and I've got that in place um, I would be up for teaching children four and a half year olds transition to school I would be up for teaching them their letters as long as they have that phonological awareness. But as I said, you are backed up by Tafariki. Got another question to Koha. Sure. I am a new entrant teacher. I'd love to, I'd love my children to come to school with more phonological awareness than they do, and it's pretty poor. How can I explain this and get the contributing preschools and kindy on side? Hmm. I mean, that's all down to relationships. Um, isn't it really the relationships you have with them do you know them and um, when I taught um, initially when I came back to um, Christchurch New Zealand um, from in the UK I was teaching at St Auburn School and one thing the AP used to do there is once a term she would 
organise an afternoon tea and invite the local um, kohanga, kindi and preschool kayakal to come along so that we would get to meet them and get to know each other. And I think that is such a great idea because um, we should be like this with our lovely colleagues who teach the students before they come to us. Often we don't even know those people. So that's the first thing, build relationships. And then the second thing she would um, sometimes do is when they were sitting down and we were having our cake, I, she would make me stand up and talk about phonological awareness and those those opportunities um, were present. You know, were able to be created because we were doing these social things with the ECE um, teachers. So I think that's a good thing um, if you can have a relationship with them and those conversations with them. Now you know that I run courses aimed at ECE. I have a developing phonological awareness course and um, an early phonics course as well, but really it's the phonological awareness. Tell them about it. I have lots of ECE teachers do my courses uh, and everything I teach is backed up by Tafariki. The thing you'll just have to be sure about is that they're not confused about what phonics is, because it is true that you might get some pushback if the ECE teacher thinks that phonics um, for under fives is about lining them up in rows and banging the alphabet um, into their brains. That is not phonics. It's not, that's not what it's about. It's about phonological awareness. And what they'll probably find is some of the things they're doing are exactly this. It's phonological awareness, but they didn't see the link and maybe they didn't teach it systematically. And that's usually um, what ACU teachers say when I have those conversations with them. So yeah, talk to them um, and see if you can build a relationship and have those conversations. You've got another question. Yeah, we've still got time. You've got another question there, Takoha. On your course, you talked about set gifts you give to children when they are little to help develop their phonological awareness. What are the gifts? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, so these are like set presents I give my whanau or my friends if they have children uh, to help develop phonological awareness. So I'm known in my family is the book giver. So all my nephews and nieces, they they know they always get books for me at their birthdays, but there are set ones that I have for the first five years. And thereafter, I choose books according to their interests. So the first book is I that I give them is Harry McClary on the day they're born. I try and get around there the same day if I can. My children all had Harry McClary when they were born. And the good thing about um, reading to babies, the best way to do it is to lie on your back on a double bed and have the baby on their back and have the book above your heads. And I read the same story every day to them. So I always say to my nephews and nieces and friends, this is the book because Harry McClary's got rhythmic language. It's rhyming. Um, it's you know it's it's that it's simple for the child the baby to look up um, at so I think that's a great story to start with now I have got a little list because I knew this question was in and then for their first um, Christmas would be a book of nursery rhymes okay and you can get those quite cheaply from the warehouse or uh, wherever you want to go but every young child needs a book of nursery rhymes and then for their first Christmas it would be you got we're going on a bear hunt again you've got that rhythmic language and you can't go over it you can't go under it. you know so uh, it's very repetitive it's got that patterning which I think is super good um Christmas would be my cat likes to hide in boxes again it's rhythmic and it's rhyming and by that age this is what their second Christmas now. Most children are really interested in cats, and so that's a good one. Uh, I've got the following um, birthday, their second birthday. I'll get them two things. I'll get them soundtracks or listening lotto. That's that listening game where you have a sound file and a bingo card. And to Koha, when you were two, you were able to do four uh, cards at once. Your grandfather would have been proud. Um, and the book would be Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See by Bill Martin. So any book by Bill Martin, you know, it's that rhythmic language, very repetitive and patterned. Um, those are the books for our young, uh, our, our, our young children. Each peach, pear, plum because for Christmas, because by then, this is their third Christmas, they know a lot of the nursery rhymes. Um, third birthday, I get a smart tray with the early accelerator. You've probably seen me use that on my courses. So that's a little game where they have to um, match and it's to help visual, um, graphic knowledge, visual um, recognition. And then Farmer Duck, How Goes the Work? Back by Martin Waddell. Then I've got the next event would be Christmas. It'd be the Gruffalo. Um, fourth birthday, Animalia by Graham Bass. I always say to my nephews and nieces, read that every day with your child. And you really have supported them fantastically for literacy when they start school. 
And then when they start school or their fifth birthday, a big book of traditional tales. So I think um, the one I usually give is the Peter Gossage um, Māori traditional tales. You know, it's, it's got the Māori stories and what have you, big, colourful illustrations, but it could be, depend on the, cult, the culture of the child you're giving to, but a book of legends or tales um, for that child. All right, so those are all my gifts. I think I've got this on my website, actually, in the parent section. So if I went too fast, uh, you can go there. Okay, Tukoha, do you have another question? Absolutely. I have got your lovely letter and mnemonic cards. I just wonder about the X with a picture of the boy doing exercise. For X, I think of X-ray or xylophone that start with that letter, not exercise. What is the reason behind that picture? Okay, uh, so that's just because there is no word where it is the first sound. So there's no word. So I had to use the picture for exercise. And uh, so it's E, there's an E, as a short vowel at the, st at the start, E before you get to the x. but if you've downloaded my mnemonics which is free to download from my website for the x card I have got a little note there explaining that when you teach that letter it's the one letter you don't ask the question first sound you ask the question what is the strong sound because there is no word where it's the first sound so x-ray is an x and xylophone is actually a z so you, you can't use either of those words to teach x if you want the x phoning Okay, I think we've got time for one more question to Koha. All right, we've got another question and that is, I have a wee group. I've been struggling with blending. They can segment sounds well, but when it comes to blending, uh, back together to work out the word, they'll often get the first and second sound right, but not the final, or they just guess the word. For example, T-I-P, they might say hit or tick. Mm -hmm. or T-O-P, they say tot or tip. Okay, so blending, it's interesting, isn't it, uh, when children find segmenting easy and blending trickier. So with segmentation, and if you've been on my primary phonics course, I've talked about having like big gaps between the phonemes, like d, o, g for dog, to help them really get every sound. But if the children are good at segmenting, I would reverse that and say, uh, don't have gaps. Make it smooth like this. Dog, cat, and blend the sounds together slowly like that. Uh, make sure the children are using that finger action because, you know, one thing that's very helpful when children are learning is to do something physical, and that's the physical um, the physical prompt for blending. So, cat, dog. So, I'll say the word, d. Um, so I'll say the word dog, and I'll say, right, I want you to break it down, but break it down with no gaps between dog. What's the word? Dog, and blend it together. The other thing you could do is take it down to two uh, words with two sounds, like m, mm, i, my, a, eh, m, mm, am, because maybe three sounds is too much for them, and do it with two sounds. So normally I'd say stick to hearing to help children with this, but of course you could get a word cut out. And if the word, say, is dog, um, have a card and uncover it in a continuous motion and get the children to, as they see the grapheme or the letter being revealed, to make the sound dog, dog, like that, and make them do it the second time faster. So I hope that helps. Um, Takoha, I think we're coming to the end now. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, Takoha, thank you for being an awesome webinar, um, webinar partner and for doing the Q&A. Isn't it great, teachers, when your children actually have some use? Thank you, Takoha. You've been great. Kaya Koma, I will um, get these up on my YouTube channel for you. Thank you so much for coming to the, the Q&A for the Early Literacy Clinic today. And happy teaching, everyone.